Hey, this is Colton Dixon, and you're listening to Dispatch Radio. All right, folks, the stories our next guest could tell. He is uh, the director and choreographer of uh, Teen Beach Movie. That's one of the uh, Disney's recent TV films that uh, earned him a DGA Award nomination. He is also the, a famous choreographer. He's worked on films like uh, Dick Tracy, Carlitos Way. He's helped direct uh, major concert tours like Madonna and Paul McCartney and all that. So we have a great guest, Jeffrey Hornaday. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. And uh I want to get right to Teen Beach Movie a little bit. Uh, congratulations on your GGA Award nomination. And give, folk, give folks a little bit of a heads up in case they haven't caught this. I know I think it's even out on DVD now. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you, uh, by the way, for that. Um, yeah, the, it, it, it was a really special uh, project I, for me, certainly. Um, it's my, again, my background in, uh, initially in choreography, my, you know, I did Flash Dance and the Chorus Line and all those feature films back in the day. And... Uh, so what, what I really liked about this piece is that it uh, it's based on the old 1960s style uh, beach party movies, beach blanket bingo, etc. But rather than recreate those kinds of movies, uh, because they were kind of flat when you go back and look at them, what we decided to do was to try and recreate the feeling you have when you think back on them, which is a sense of whimsy and enthusiasm and kind of this magical feel. So by taking that tack with it, it gave us the license, especially with the musical se- musical numbers, is to blow them up and make them bigger than life. So we, we were on the beach doing Busby Berkeley-esque dance numbers with spinning surfboards and overhead shots. So it really allowed us to open up creatively to, to kind of take the, 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 the sequences anywhere we wanted to go. But at the heart of it, it's very simply a story about a, uh, a two modern kids uh, who... Uh, like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, find themselves trapped inside one of their old favorite movies. And like Dorothy, the, 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 you know, the thrust of the story is these two kids trying to get their way back to modern times. And, and on the way, they find out a lot about themselves. So that by the time they're, they get home, they have been enlightened and, and, and have kind of been transformed. Uh, so for me, again, for me, it's like, how often do you get to do uh, you know, a modern realistic movie where simultaneously you get to do a full-blown breakout in the song and dance period piece. So it's kind of a special piece. You said the uh, 60s beach party films, and they were always just, they're just so much fun and, and entertaining, a great way to just escape from things and that kind of thing. Is this, yeah. is this more of a throwback, an homage? How, what, do you, what do you tell people when they ask, you know, kind of, am I going to like this film or not? I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's an homage in that it, it kind of, references those movies, but again, we didn't want to just recreate them. So, the, you know, for example, the, the, the we musically we picked up on the kind of Beach Boys sound of, the, of, of that period, but we gave it, because the two kids are modern, we gave simultaneously a new kind of modern spin. So it's not like seeing a, a, a vintage kind of old film. You're really getting uh, this mashup of something very period in 60s influence with, with, with something that's also very modern. Sounds fantastic. So yeah. this was your second DGA nom. It's kind of followed off your previous one was called Geek Charming. Tell folks a little bit about that film. That, that was my first time I, I worked with Disney, and, and it was a, a whole different kind of thing. It, it, it didn't have any musical sequences, and it was a, basically a romantic comedy. And uh, uh, Sarah Hyland from uh, the TV series uh, Modern Family was the star of it, and uh, it was just you know it was about these you know these 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 two kids and and she was kind of from a patrician family and he was from the other side of the tracks and uh, they meet each other and against all odds fall in love and and on on and on the way they have this kind of wild romp and uh, but ultimately again like the other film it's really about two kids finding themselves and. Uh, you know, uh, and about love. Disney seems like they've really embraced doing a lot of uh, TV films and really trying to tap into that as well instead of having to go to a full major le- release and that kind of thing. Do you, what is what is their approach when they're kind of putting these kind of projects together? The, the, these two projects were, were, were very different. The first one was based on a, a, a book, and they developed the script in-house. And then once they had a, you know, a locked script, then they reached out to directors and 
uh, you know, we, we, I met with them and we connected and they liked the take I had on it. So that was basically, you know, winning a commission in, 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 in effect. Whereas with Teen Beach Movie, I had a good relationship with them at that point and we approached this because it's a, you know, a musical. We, we kind of approached it like how you would put together a Broadway show. So we were integrating uh, musical sequences into the, into the script as we were developing the script. Um, and uh, rather than, you know, approach designing the musical numbers like you would do a music video, for example, we really did a kind of the Broadway workflow. We got into a, 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 you know, a studio with a composer at a piano, talked about what the theme was, kind of sketched it out, and, and then uh, developed it very much with, with uh, not only with the story in mind, but with the actors that would be performing the numbers. So it was a, you know, it was like a, kind of doing an old-style Broadway show approach. I'm always so impressed with the, the musical aspects of, of films because, you know, it's hard enough to get all the moving parts to kind of work in sequence anyway. Then you start adding something like that with the, the choreography and the music. It's just always incredible. And you come from a long line of some incredible success stories being a choreographer. But I wanted to kind of get your opinion on, give people a little behind it, uh, scene taste of how different it is putting the, the palette together, so to speak, for like something you worked right. on. You worked on Dick Tracy and Tango and Cash. Not exactly the uh, the same approach. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's as a choreographer, especially in films, you know, what your job is is really to look at the story, look at the scene that the sequences take place in, and really get under the skin of, of, of what that scene and the intent of that scene is. Uh, because if you don't do that, then it kind of feels like the choreography is just kind of pasted on, whereas if you develop it very specifically with the scene and the actors in mind, it feels much more organic. Um, you know, a movie like Flashdance uh, was, was, was an approach, but I had the freedom to uh, devise the choreography any way I wanted to because, you know, we had great dancers to work with. Whereas on Dick Tracy, uh, I, I uh, did a, a, a production number that uh, featured Madonna and Al Pacino. <laughs> you know, and Al Pacino's character was this really over-the-top gangster. Uh, and uh, so getting in a room with Madonna and uh, Al Pacino and trying to devise a number was a whole different approach than working, for example, on a chorus line where I had a room full of 50 professional dancers. Uh, and I really enjoyed that process, again, because you can't just do what's comfortable uh, as the choreographer. You really have to find what works for the actors and what they feel confident and organic doing. And, and that's, for me, a really an, an interesting process of, of, of collaboration with them and, and trying to tease out what really feels comfortable and organic for them. How does the work as a choreographer when you're working with the, the team for uh, intense action sequences. Obviously, in Dick Tracy, you had some of those, you know, shoot up the car sequences, but more so in like Tango and Cash where you're flipping a car and, and those kinds of things. And, you know, I know you've got, you know, the stunt folks and the director's vision and all that. What is your role in uh, piecing that puzzle together? The thing that's, that, that's I think, that's fun as a choreographer is not every filmmaker, every director has uh, experience with, with, with dance and musical sequences. So uh, what's required is a very close collaboration so that you can uh, you know, be of service to them in terms of, ha of how to shoot it and how to design it. So uh, I was really fortunate because I, I, I was you know, put in rooms with Francis Ford Coppola and Mel Brooks and Adrian Lyne and Warren Beatty and uh, for me, that was like getting a first-hand on, you know, on-the-job training to ultimately start to, to, to direct. But more specifically, to answer your question, like in Dick Tracy, uh, there was, a, uh, for example, one montage where it wanted to push the story forward in terms of, sh of showing how the antagonist and his, you know, and his crime syndicate were doing robbing banks and blowing up cars and all that kind of action stuff that you described. But what we wanted to do is make it feel like it was driven by the music. So rather than them going off and shooting action sequences and turning it over to an editor to, 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 to piece it together with just the action in mind, 
we, we laid it out against a musical grid. So uh, and Stephen Sondheim wrote the music. So I worked with Stephen in terms of getting the, the structure of the music together. And then we were able to storyboard very specifically where the dance sequences would come in and how that would make us a, a segue to a, a bit of action. You know, for example, there, there was a, a, a few dance moves where these showgirls did something and ended up with them kind of doing this theatrical vaudeville-like punch. And right on that punch, you cut to in the street with a gangster punching and knocking somebody out in the street. So the, the action, in effect, becomes as choreographed and as musical as the, as the dance counterpoint that is edited again. You obviously had an opportunity to work with him more than one time, and obviously Michael Jackson was probably one of the most incredible showmen of our time. And Captain right. e, Captain EO, when you when you sit down, and you start to piece together Captain EO. Does he come with a lot of uh, you know sort of predetermined ideas of certain things that he wants to accomplish? Is it more like a clean plate, and you kind of like get to sit down and brainstorm and piece this together? How was that creative process? That's a really good question. Uh, and again, that working with Michael was one of the first times where uh, I discovered this process of setting my own uh, familiar style aside and really having to, to, to get under the skin of the, of the performer. Uh, what we initially did, uh, which is the kind of preparation I did on the, the real specific dance movies, like the chorus line, I would get into a studio with my assistant, listen to the music, I would block out where the structure of the number was going to go, and I would choreograph the material itself very specifically to whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, naturally, I would, it, it would evolve out of what felt comfortable uh, and what synced up with, with my own style. So, uh, whereas with the approach with Michael, I, I, you know, I started with that same kind of approach, prepared a bunch of material, got into a, to a studio with him. He was fantastic because he, he allowed it to be a blank slate, and so we started to... To, 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 to actually work, and I started to give him choreography. And what became apparent very quickly was that where I was coming from choreographically was a whole different place from, from where he was coming from. And the reason that he was so brilliant at what he did is he, he originated his own style from what he felt really comfortable doing with movement and how music, music affected him. So I said to myself, I said, wow, you know what? He looks kind of stiff when I just give him choreography that has nothing to do with what he does. So the solution we came up with was I brought in some video cameras and just let them roll during rehearsal. And we would put music on and just, you know, play around and, and improvise. So he would improvise moves and stuff, and I would jump up and go, oh, that's great, do that again. And we kind of, I kind of let him create uh, this choreographic vernacular, so to speak. And then what I would do is take those tapes home at night, study those, synthesize from those videos what was his core kind of uh, choreographic vernacular again. And then I would use that as the, as the, as the, the library of, of material and movement to then go in the next day and start to put together the, create, the, the actual choreography, but using what he did organically uh, as the basis. And consequently, because it originated from what he did organically and improvisationally, it, it looked great. He was doing his thing. So my job was really to find a structure and a process where we could mine what he did organically in, in, in his own original style. Fantastic. And I want to get lastly to the other chapter of your resume, which is just incredible is you know working with them actually on tour you know touring with madonna paul mccartney michael jackson even miley cyrus and those kinds of things so do you go in at stage one a, sim a similar kind of process where you sit down and you kind of block this all together or do they artists usually come in with certain song ideas or certain visuals that they want to try to incorporate or how do you piece that story together the, i'll give you just a couple quick uh examples one madonna the other paul mccartney uh madonna uh very, very uh, hands-on and very, very specific about not necessarily what it's going to actually be manifest visually, but about the vision and about the, the way she wants things to feel. So, so rather than starting with, uh, you know, preconceived ideas, we would just hang out a lot and talk about, you know, what the show might be, what it would be kind of thematically and you know, what she was wanting to, 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 to kind of achieve with the show. You know, for example, uh, at that time, 
you know, AIDS was coming into the uh, to, to the floor, and there was a uh, a campaign called Safe Sex, and uh, so she was really passionate about that and wanted to make that statement. And we said to ourselves, you know, we we were talking. I said, well, how can we take this statement? And make it a worldwide comment and get real attention and press out of uh, out of it, rather than it just being a snippet in her show for that audience that was there that night. And again, her her kind of toolkit for for pop self expression was to be kind of shocking. So what we came up with was her song "Papa Don't Preach." We were going. We knew we were going to be going to Italy. So what we designed for uh, video and photographic screen content was we used montages of the Pope because he was against safe sex. And we, so we did this comment that the Papa that shouldn't preach was the Pope, and we juxtaposed imagery of him with, uh, w- w- with text you know, that, that was an affirmation of, of safe sex. And we knew that it would cause kind of, a, 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 of an uproar, and it did. So when we went to, to, to Italy to do the show, they threw us out of the country. <laughs> and that gave us worldwide attention. You know, yeah, the Pope kicked us out of the country. So the whole world press was on that story. And because they were on that story, we were able to get that message out in, in, a, in a much more uh, uh, broader broad way. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that so she was a very strategic thinker, and, and and we got all those ideas up front, and then we would then manifest those visually, bring the lighting designer in, uh, choreographers, uh, uh, set designers, and then we knew what we wanted to deliver, and basically what the pr- the production components are, our delivery system for 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 presenting that 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 concept. So that's how we kind of started with that. Whereas Paul McCartney was a whole different approach. Um, you know, he's very kind of, he came in a very surreal way and would, would give these kind of metaphors, and then we were charged with having to interpret those and turn it into choreography and, 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 and stagecraft. I remember one day he came into the studio and he said, I was thinking, you know, what if we have a 17th century patrician woman in a, in a uh, uh, you know, a powdered wig and a long periwinkle dress? See what you can do with that. <laughs> you know, and I kind of thought, okay, well, what do you do with that? And so we, he would come up with these tidbits that didn't seem to have any kind of cohesion and connective tissue. But as we kind of intuitively worked on these different kind of vignettes, what we discovered is it somehow created this very complex integrated structure, and it made it look like we were really smart and had this whole concept up front, but we really discovered it as we were just kind of throwing ourselves off the cliff with it. So that was a whole different kind of way of working. That's fantastic. Paul McCartney coming up with Brainstorms the Night Before. It's some movie or something that he sees. He gets visuals in his head. Next thing you know, uh, Jeffrey's got to come up with stuff fitting it into the stage show. <laughs> Uh, lastly, just give you a chance. Uh, you got an upcoming project or anything like that uh, right around the corner? Yeah, uh, I, I just finished writing a, a, a script for, for Disney, and um, you know they, they, they met with good reception, and, and so we're just in the phases of, of of looking at what it would mean to you know to get it uh, produced and where we would shoot it, all the kind of pre pre production stuff. So I think that might be the next thing. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, we've been talking with Jeffrey Horn today. We appreciate all your time and wonderful stories and insight and uh, wish you the best of luck till we can talk again. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.